In an ocean of podcasts, we are Cthulhu. This is Spoiler Country. We are Walter and Louise Simonson. Thanks for listening. Hey, hey, people of Earth, it's time to enter the Spoilerverse via our secret portal of the exclusive Arctic Club in beautiful downtown Seattle with our hosts, John and Henrik and Jeff. Welcome to Spoiler Country. Hey, if you're listening to our show for the first time and you're on one of the social medias that we're on, like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any of those kinds of things, you should always check us out on SpoilerVerse.com. But if you want to keep up with our latest episodes, you should bring out your smartphone, get into your favorite podcaster, Find Spoiler Country and hit subscribe. Then you'll get all our new stuff. And if you want to reach out to us, you can do that in two ways. You can call us and leave us a voicemail at 707-656-2080. Again, 707-656-2080. Or you can shoot us an email at spoilercountry at gmail.com. Join the cult of the Spoilerverse. And welcome back to Spoiler Country. I'm Kenneth Regan. That's Mr. Horsley. And today on the show... Well, this one is... Uh, super, super special. Uh, it's yeah. actually really awesome. Actually, <laughs> we got to is pretty awesome. Was- yeah, we got to sit and have a really long conversation with Walt and Wheezy Simonson. It was amazing. And we have video, so if you're hearing this on audio, head to our YouTube channel. You can see one. You'll see our pretty faces talking right now, mm. and then you'll see a full video of us with Walt and Wheezy talking about everything from the death of Superman to magic to everything. I mean, yep. it's, it's to Ragnarok to Thor. It's, it's, it's an in-depth conversation and we yep. have it on video. So it's awesome. And Wheezy made me feel so much better about <laughs> the Inferno crossover event and magic back in the yeah. 80s. So there you go. Can't ask for more than that. And she also made me feel better. She also made me feel better about the death of Superman and, and uh, you know, the Snyder verse and Superman and Man of Steel. <laughs> right. Sorry, Robert, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were really cool. I, it was, they were it awesome. was fantastic. Uh, Walt was putting on his best David Letterman. Um, it was a lot of fun. So yeah. should we just sit back and watch? Let's do it. We don't ever get to say that. let's sit back listen to Walt and Wheezy in their own all right guys thanks for coming back and today on the show this is super super special Um, I'm excited because these two have been a huge factor in my comic book reading career (laughs) <laughs> and all the fun I've had. He drew Manhunter, Thor, Fantastic Four for a number of years, and did the adaptation of Alien by Heavy Metal, and he's a secret paleontologist. She wrote on X-Factor, New Mutants. She co-created Cable, Apocalypse, Steel, Doomsday, and Power Pack, and was the model for one of the most iconic covers in comic history. Walton Wheezy Simonson, thank you so much for coming on the show. Our pleasure to be here. Our pleasure. That was a mouthful, let me tell you. <laughs> you guys have been everywhere and have done everything when it comes to comics. Uh, let's just start from the beginning. Uh, Walt, we'll start with you. How did you get into comics? What was, your, what was the driving force that made you fall in love with this? Uh, really, it was being able to draw and being able to tell stories. Um, as it. you'll see in this uh, interview, I like to talk. Um, but I also, I began drawing before I can remember somewhere before kindergarten, my mom yeah. told me this, I believe her. Um, and so I always drew pictures, uh, when I was in college originally, uh, to, as a geology major or the idea of studying paleontology, I discovered Marvel comics. This was the mid sixties. So yeah. it was really great work from Stan and Jack and Steve and Don Heck. Bill Everett was doing work there, and all these different guys are just great stuff. Very entertaining. I had read comics as a kid, but I didn't discover Marvel until I was about 19, uh, right in the middle of all that stuff. Yeah. And so I, I didn't, at the time, think, wow, I'd like to do this. I just thought, these are great. So I bought all the comics Marvel put out, which back then was, what, 11 titles maybe? 
um, but I could afford all of them when I was in college back then. So I bought them, read them. And then when I graduated from college, I decided not to go on in paleontology. I had some reasons for that, but I, yes. I just decided that was not my calling. And I took a year off, lived at home, uh, and then uh, decided to try art school. I'd taken a few art courses, never liked them. I, all I wanted to do was draw. And in art courses, you have to, okay, today it's paper mache construction. Right. And then now next tomorrow, it's toothpick construction. I Give me a pencil, just let me draw. <laughs> so I went, to, but I went to art school. I didn't know what else to do, really. Um, and while I was there, I began doing some comics just on my own. Uh, the original one, little bits and pieces here and there. I had a little bit in college as well. <clears throat> and the more I did it, the more interest I got in it. And so ultimately, I did a comic book as my degree project. I had a 50-page story over two years of something oh, wow. called the Star Slammers, which was a <clears throat> science fiction, pulp science fiction stuff. And uh, that became my portfolio. The early work in the Slammers, my junior year, is not bad fan work. And the work I did my senior year begins to approach professional. And so yeah. I took that work as my portfolio. And I went to New York and I showed my port at a time when you could go in and show your portfolio. It's different now with the web and the companies. Right. But back then, you could. I got appointments. I went to show editors. And uh, in the end at DC, which is where I went first, because I liked the work they were doing at the end of the 60s, yeah. I ended up talking to Carmen Infantino, who was the publisher at that time, yep. completely really on a fluke. But uh, he liked my work a lot. If it went up to the regular editors, I'd probably been out working McDonald's. But <laughs> Carmen liked my stuff. And he made three of his editors give me a short story each. Back then, comics had short stories in them, so you could learn your craft. And hide you, you know, the crappy job hidden behind the beautiful Alex Toth story up in the front. <laughs> and so I, uh, I got work that way. And uh, within six months, I was doing work for Archie Goodwin, who was an editor at DC back then. Archie had been given detective comics with Batman to do. Yeah. And about six months into my career, he offered me Manhunter, a new strip he wanted to do in the back of detective comics. Just a little backup that would be kind of antithetical to Batman, where Batman was dark and gritty and and the city urban manhunter would be all over the world. It was still kind of gritty, but it was, he had a red costume. It was a whole, you know, a different look. Right. And really didn't use weapons, a batarang maybe manhunter was armed and, and used his arms. Um, and <laughs> when that series was over, it was about seven issues that ran by month. This was a little over a year's worth of work. Yeah. Um, that made my career in comics because it won a bunch of awards. And when I began that six months in, I was one more kid doing comics. When I was done, I knew all the editors. The editors all knew who I was, and the, and the freelancers as well, generally. And I was really offered work from that point. I didn't go scuffling, which I'd had to do before. So oh, that's that awesome. pretty well. That's awesome. Weezy, I know that you lived in the same apartment complex with Bernie Wrightson, and he gave you, he had you model that first, that first uh, cover of Swamp Thing. Is that really your first foray into comic books or, or were you watching these guys do what they're doing? You're like, I want to be a part of this. Um, it didn't occur to me to be a part of it at that point. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I was at the right place at the right time. And Bernie, for some reason, decided to photograph, uh, use photo reference, which he hadn't really done much before. Yeah. So, you know, he got a batch of us together. Kaluta's the bad guy in that particular sequence. And I think Bernie's the hero. And I, I think Jeff maybe took the photos I, or was behind the camera. I don't even remember that part. But, um, yeah, no, it hadn't really occurred to me. Um, you know, later on, I got kind of semi-interested. But I, was, I had a job in advertising promotion at McFadden Bartell. And uh, I was a magazine publisher back in the day. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I was still reading comics. I mean, I read the Warren books and, you know, the occasional floppy. The temporella and stuff. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, one of my friends worked, uh, I had a batch of friends who were in comics. Yeah. Um, and one of them suggested that I try out, try Warren because they were looking for somebody to work in production. And, um, I could do the job and it paid better than my job. So I said, okay, great. And I went over there and got, and I applied and I got the job. 
and about, I was not great at production, however, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my friends in production would, would be appalled at, at the, the quality of my production work. And, but I was really good at the editorial type stuff. Yeah. It was a very small company. Um, they would, every time they, they'd come in and they'd say, oh gosh, we need somebody to do a letters page. And I'd say, I could do that. And I could do, I could, I could write copy. I could do this. I could do that. So they just created an assistant editor position from me and moved yeah. me out of editor, out of production, which was probably a wise move into ed editorial. And I mean, I, I, I liked comics at that point. I loved making comics. I loved the whole process. Yeah. And the more I did it, the more I liked it. Now, I, I mean, I always loved you... stories and art. Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of a natural. That's cool. At Warren, you guys were doing Vampirella during that time, right? We were. And you had Frank Frazetta doing some of those amazing covers. Did you get Frank, to meet him? But I, oh, yes, I had met him. Yeah. But by the time I was there, Frank was beyond doing covers for Warren and you know I'm doing other stuff yeah but of course I met him yeah he's he was he was a very very lovely guy oh, met him cool. and his whole family so Italian. you guys met I, I believe through Archie Goodwin correct yes that's correct and what year was that I have no idea Walter what year would we meet 1973 <laughs> I never know when anything happened. But was it an it was was, <laughs> was it an instant attraction for you two? Well, we we okay. What what we both remember is a telephone call. Walt, Walter was working on Manhunter at the time, and I had been over at Archie's because I knew Anne and Archie, and I had seen the Manhunter pages, and I loved the way Walter drew hands. I mean, I didn't know him, but I, this artist, I knew he drew hands great. And so, um, you know, Anne and I would switch babysitting back and forth. And I think it was Anne and Archie's anniversary. And they were away, and I was over at their house watching their kids. And um, this person calls on the phone and asks to talk to Archie. And I don't know why, why, how we got talking about Manhunter or whatever we're talking about comics. I guess he, he must have said, oh yeah, he wanted to talk to Archie about, you know, some comic strip he was doing or something. And I said, oh my gosh, you're the guy who draws the great hands. <laughs> and so that was our first real meeting, I think, right? Walter was yeah. over the phone. Yep, that was our first conversation. Wow. Yeah, and, and then, but then they had a party at their house. I think that was after that. And it was, and, and, and you know, there were a batch of people there and Walter, at Milgram was your roommate at that point. That's right. Yes. By that time, I was living in Queens with Alan Milgram. Yeah, and Alan Milgram was very friendly, and he talked to me, and other people talked to me, and Walter didn't say a word. He just was over there on the other side of the room. You know, like he, he was, I, I thought, well, this guy really He's hates me. You know, I wonder what I said to offend him. But <laughs> there you go. But, yes, yeah, so they introduced us. Eventually, we got to know each other better. And <laughs> Back in those days, I was shy, and she was too pretty. So I oh, I don't think so. It. Maybe, well, well, maybe yeah. that was it. I think you were shyer in the olden days. You wouldn't have any problems. Well, no, now it wouldn't be a big deal, but back then I was. <laughs> but it all worked out. Well, when you were working at DC, you created Dr. Phosphorus, correct? I did. Yeah. Well, it was what Steve Englehart. You and Steve Englehart. What was the, uh, how did that idea come up with him? Because he's, he's a pretty cool villain. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I mean, it's, it, uh, when I was at the Rhode Island School, I went to Rhode Island School of Design, RISD for mm -hmm. short. And when I was at RISD, uh, they, I was an illustration major. That's why I did my Star Slammers series for illustrationism. Yeah. Both my, as a junior project and as a senior degree project. The, jun the guy I taught the juniors was a gentleman named Tom Seguris, who was quite a wonderful painter and illustrator himself. He'd been a RISD graduate 30 years earlier. He worked in all kinds of media. He was very uh, conscious of letter forms, um, really an all-around guy, and a very nice guy. And he taught juniors. So uh, he wanted a, uh, an overall, an overarching project. That's kind of how the Star Slammers got started. But you know what I've done? I've forgotten the question. I, was <laughs> up, I know how to do with Tom. <laughs> Dr. Phosphorus. Dr. Phosphorus. That's okay. That's really Tom's idea. That was really Tom's idea. When Tom was young, yeah. he, uh, he and his brother apparently were big comic book fans. And they came up with the idea of a bad guy named Phosphor. 
it was, I guess, kind of a walking skeleton or a skeleton guy. Or yeah. I'm not sure what they had in mind for him for the look. I don't remember. But that was the name. And, and something, the guy flames, you know, like phosphorus, whatever. And so uh, he told me about it. He'd actually, uh, he had uh, been asked by Al Cap if he would come be Al's assistant after he graduated from RISD, if he'd be Al's assistant on Little Abner, the newspaper strip. Yeah. And he, he thought about it because the money was pretty good, I think, for, especially those days for a brand new graduate. But he decided in the end he would rather be the best Tom Seguris he could be rather than being the second best Al Cap or the third best Al Cap. That so he sense. declined the job and went on to become a really good Tom Seguris. So we were talking about comics. Uh, nobody at RISD knew comics, uh, especially when I was doing my project. But I learned, so I, I taught storytelling to myself. But I learned about perspective and costumes and, and uh, set design, all sorts of stuff that goes into making pictures for comic books. About picture making, really. Yeah. Composition. And, uh, uh, but I got this from Tom. So when I was asked to do a couple of issues of Batman with Steve, we talked about it. I do not remember the conversation now. But I do know that I brought Foster to the table and said, you know, we could, you could do this guy if there's something we could do with him. And Steve put it together in a way that made a character out of him. Julie Schwartz, you know, Julie was an old science fiction fan. He'd been one of the really, I think probably part of first fandom, but one of the old science fiction fans from the very beginning. And a lot of his comics reflected that. They had this kind of science or pseudoscience quality about them or look yeah. to them or explanation to them. And so he changed the name Phosphor to Dr. Phosphorus. So that was really uh, Julia's contribution. But that's where the character came from. It came out of my old teacher, Tom Seguris, through me to Steve, and then renamed by Julie, and out came the character. That is cool. That so, is cool. Weezy, when you look at Walt's work, and you see characters like Dr. Phosphorus come to light, is, is there some influence there? for? Because you've written and created some very iconic characters. And I'm always curious, how, what influences are you taking those from? Now, Weezy's on her own. She's not swiping my stuff. <laughs> I, th- I, well, I was trying to set it up because I'm thinking it might be the other way around sometimes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, no. ideas from everywhere. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, you know, you, sometimes you don't even know where your ideas come from. I mean, sometimes they come from desperation. It's like, oh, my gosh, I got to think of something. Um, so Archie was good at that. Archie was really good. At waiting for the buckshot was almost at his rear end, and he had had nothing. And all of a sudden, the buckshot's right there, and suddenly, bam, 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 bam. It was all there, and That's it was awesome. great. But the, Archie was very much a deadline-driven guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I did, but she's right. Ideas just come from. They come from everywhere. Yeah. I mean, Beta Ray Bill started because I I had the idea when I took over Thor to try and do something. I wanted to do a story nobody told before. Yeah. And nobody had really told a story about somebody else being worthy and picking up the hammer. And so that was the first idea was this would make an interesting story. And then the next idea is how do I design a character who can do that? My own feeling is that in 20 years of Thor, which is about what had gone on before I took over the book, there had not been a story where anybody picked up the hammer. Loki picked it up once because he had, it was Jack, Stan and Jack were doing it, because he had some extra juice in the Norn Queen. But really, that's just a lie. There's not a chance in hell that Loki would pick the hammer up, no matter how much juice he had. So I just chose to ignore that story. But ultimately, um, I, just, I wanted to create a character from the ground up. I decided that nobody in the Marvel Universe could lift it. I still yeah. maintain that, even though other people have lifted it since then. I mean, I knew when I did the story, I was letting the genie out of the bottle. And other writers would want their characters to pick up the hammer. But right. I'm just telling you right now, those guys are all wrong. <laughs> so I ended up creating a character. I made him look like a monster because mostly monsters are bad guys in comics. Uh, there, there are not, not very many handsome monsters or, or good guy monsters. And so you want to mislead the reader. You want the reader not to know what, you, what the story is going to be. Why would they buy the comic? Why would you buy a story where you knew what the answer was going to be before you finished the comic? And yeah. so I made him look like a monster, so people would think he was bad. And and what really happened? All the letter I read, I wrote the letter columns. I read all the letters that came in. And what happened was all the letters came in. They didn't. Nobody said, "Oh, Beta Ray Bill must be a good guy because he picked up the hammer." They all said, "You don't know what the hell you're doing. 
You just screwed this up. You know, how can a bad guy pick up the hammer? And and nobody. I've I've had one or two people since then say, "Oh, I knew it." Uh, sure you did. Um, yeah, sure you knew it. Of course you knew it. But by and large, I mean nobody. You know, that's why you do some of that stuff. So that's kind of how Bill came. All the characters. I mean, Wheezy had an idea for Apocalypse. You could talk about that. What Apocalypse was really about, which I thought was great. And I will say that aspect of his character was not in the film. Yeah. Yeah. Apocalypse is a um, iconic. How did how did you come up with him? Well, you know, I you had asked about how char- how we how I came up with characters, yep. and usually it's in service of the story, rather than you know I come up with a character who does blah blah blah, and um, then I fit him into a story. Mostly, I come up with a story first, and a, a story requirement. Yeah. And then I make somebody who'll fit it. Um, with Apocalypse, because mutants are an evolved sort of character. Right. They, you know, they, they, they are part of the evolution of humanity, whatever. Um, I wanted a character who would have participated in that. Yeah. Which I thought, well, you know, a mutant from the beginning of time, yeah. Um, somebody who's been around and messing with things in a Darwinian sort of way, trying to create others like himself. That, that Apocalypse was the very first mutant in my mind. That's what happened anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, a survival of the fittest kind of thing. Um, so I, that's really where Apocalypse came from. And then, of course, you know, you think of, well, how would he do this? Well, you put the species under pressure and yeah. you see what comes out. And how did you do that? Apocalypse after apocalypse after oh, apocalypse. Okay, we'll call him apocalypse. And um, that's that's how that's why and how he was made. Yeah. Um, you know, that's probably how most of my characters got put together in service of the story. I mean, yeah. Bill was created because I had an idea for the hammer, right? And, and started off, and I think that's you know kind of where I think I needed somebody to really screw with Balder when I was doing Marvel's uh, Thor, and I think that's kind of where Malekith came from. Um, Malekith the Accursed kind of gave me somebody to run up against Balder in a way that was very devastating for Balder. And yeah. so you kind of, that's kind of how I mean, that stuff, I mean, I did a, I, I'm doing a book called Ragnarok right now. I, I, I love that book, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I'm um, not kidding. When it first came out, I got the first one. And then I always think that I want to buy a book that it's going to go up in value and then I'm going to sell it. I never do. I have every single book I, I've bought and, you know, I don't get rid of anything I love it so much. When I get it signed and they're like, you want me to, to, to write it out to you? It's always a big fat yes. Please put to Kenrick from. Because <laughs> I, I love it so much. And yeah, your Ragnarok, that first issue, I think I have every single cover that came out. Like I couldn't oh. go to New York, Sandy. I couldn't go to New York Comic Con, right. so I bought it off of eBay just so I could get. You know what I mean? And <laughs> Thank I, you. My I mortgage. Just wanted all those different covers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I absolutely love the work that you're doing on that. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I was what I was going to say about it was simply that in the beginning, within a couple of issues, I introduced Ratatosk, who's a squirrel that's in the yep. North Myths, and in the North Myths. He really just runs up and down the world tree. There's an eagle up at the top of the world tree. There's a serpent down at the bottom. He runs up to the eagle. The eagle trash talks the serpent. Ratatosk runs down to the serpent, says, here's what the eagle said about you. And then the serpent trash talks the eagle. Ratatosk runs back up, tells the, and they just, he's an insult merchant. He runs back and forth telling these insults. And that's really, I think that's the only story we have of him in the Norse myths. They're kind of fragmentary. So yeah. I don't know what else he, purpose he served. But I sort of like the smart ass aspect of the squirrel. And so I needed a character to kind of keep Thor alive in the prison he was in. This is a spoiler alert, by the way. Yeah. Because most people not have read this book. That's okay. But uh, I, I created him and I gave him kind of a slightly shortened speech pattern. Um, and I gave him the quality of not being in awe of Thor. This may be an old God and a half dead God, or maybe a right. completely dead God. That's where the jury is still out. But he, uh, Ratatusk, you know, he, he was, it, it turns out he had some purpose that it, uh, Odin had given him. And when I first introduced him, I really was using him for the plot purpose. I needed to keep Thor going. I had not at all planned to make him a regular character in the book. And, but on the other hand, if you have a solo book with one character, 
if he's not traveling, which Thor is most of the time in my comic, there's nobody else to talk to. So you end up with a lot of internal monologues, which can be kind of boring, or an overvoiced narration of like, you know, I walk in the door, I turn and let my mob, whatever it is. <laughs> and that's not very exciting either. So Ratatusk ended up becoming a, com- a companion because he's a smart ass, because he doesn't, doesn't get any crap from Thor, and because he gives Thor someone to talk to, and vice versa, in a way that I found much more interesting to write. So as a character, he evolved naturally out of a one-off situation. And it's like those TV sitcoms or dramas where they bring in some actor for a show or a soap, soap opera. They bring him in for a couple of shows or her in for a couple of shows. She becomes very popular, and suddenly they make her a regular character in the series from then on. Yeah, and that happens a lot. So this was kind of that thing. So most of the characters, I think, like Wheezy, my characters are are grounded in the original stories and then become something beyond that. The ones that make it. Yeah. You know, interestingly enough, and you know, in, along those same lines, um, Archangel yeah. was created partly because we thought that he had. I don't know, 1960 powers in a 1980s world. Yeah. So we, we wanted to up his power level. That, so that was actually kind of, you know, it was driven by the story. But then, you know, we, because of, you know, the villain that we had, Apocalypse, um, you know, we were able to turn that, that lovely, gentle angel character into the deadly archangel. Yeah, I, I liked what you guys did in Fallen Mutants with, with Angel because of all the characters, because I was a big X-Men fan. Chris Claremont, I think his run on X-Men is definitive. I don't think it's any better than that. Yeah. And he, his writing and the fact that he brought up social issues within the books kind of shaped a lot of how I look at the world, Mm -hmm. you know, because I, I read that. And when you guys, but I always thought Angel was kind of like, it was like, well, how is he going to help? And I mean, yeah, he can fly, but all these other people are so overpowered compared to him and they can fly and plus they can, you know, they're, they're super strong or they have whatever is going on. And when you guys took him and basically, like you just said, upgraded him, it was like, Oh, now he's, now he's badass. <laughs> now he can he was, really I mean, hold his in own. In the sixties, he was a character in the sixties. You know, he could fly originally, he could fly for about an hour up to about 10,000 feet. Yeah. And that's, you know, in the sixties, early sixties, that was, that was pretty interesting. But by the time we were doing it, it wasn't as. In fact, I mean, one of Weezy's ideas when we were doing that book was to upgrade the powers in general of the team because they was they were 60s powers in the 80s world. Now, some of them, like Cyclops and Jean Grey, you didn't have to do anything to them. You know, Cyclops, instead of, you know, melting a tin can, he could blow a hole in a mountain. But it was the same visual power. So right. you could just do whatever you needed to have done with it. Jean Grey, the same way. Um, but we turned Hank back into a beast. So he was stronger and faster, and of course he had more problems thinking, which makes an interesting character. But that's kind of where that came from. And we gave, uh, we ran Iceman's powers out of control, so he had to wear a belt for a while to reduce the, uh, help him control what was going on. So yeah. really, we did a, we did three different juicings of power in that book. Archangel was the most dramatic, because of course his look also changed dramatically. And we did it in a really horrible way by cutting off his wings. So that was really terrible. <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> it was pretty gruesome. I remember when it, when it happened, I was like, oh, I can't believe they went there. <laughs> that's well. I know, I know. You know, you, that's one of the things about a good story. When I, I did a story with Balder and when I was doing Thor for Marvel. And yeah. I, Thor, Balder had to go to talk to Loki, carry a message from Odin. And, and Loki blew him off. And he blew him off in a way that just infuriated Boulder. And init- originally, I had Loki kind of push, or Boulder rather, kind of shove Loki to the ground, whip out a sword, and then drive it. And when you look, it turns out he's driven it like right into the ground next to his head. But that oh. was it. I was talking to Chris Claremont. And Chris, Chris milks the juice out of every story. It's just one of the things he's really good at. Yeah. And I was talking to him about it. And he said, I, I'm pretty sure the way I remember it is that Chris said, oh, I thought he was going to cut Loki's head off. And I thought, wow, <laughs> what a great idea. So I, I thought about that and I thought, well, Loki's a sorcerer. He has magical powers. It's not going to matter much to him, really, whether he gets his head cut off or not. That could work out great. 
And so that really, that was one of the things about having the companies in New York and living in New York yeah. and sharing everything in the way we did that. Now with the internet, I mean, doing stuff like this, these remote interviews, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and it's, it gives you access in a way you don't ha didn't have access to, to fans and other people like crazy. Right. But back then, like I knew all the guys, so did Wheezy. We knew all the guys in our generation. We knew all the guys pretty much in the generation ahead of us or two generations ahead of us. So I, you know, Jack, I only met a couple times, once for a conversation, a couple other times, very brief. I didn't know Jack much. I knew Stan a little bit. Um, I knew Joe Kubert pretty well. So I knew all these guys whose work I really admired. And then I knew all the guys in my generation. I was close friends with a half dozen of them. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> but you would get things like that. You'd go into the office all the time because you took your pages in. No internet, no uh, faxes, those suckers in. no overnight delivery. Um, no, you know, so you had to go in. You had to live around New York City as a result. And uh, you took your stuff in. You saw when, well, Chris would be bringing in script pages and then tell you endlessly of the stories he had in mind, which was fabulous. You, you don't want to hear too many of them. You're afraid you might steal something before you, before you had a chance to write it up. Or Chris might steal one of yours. But you'd see a bunch of artwork, um, work from really great guys. I, I still remember being in the D.C. office in about 73, and Alex Toth's job, Burma Skies, came. I think Archie wrote it. But it was about a, uh, just a, a World War II, I think, aircraft uh, fighter plane type story, flight story. And it was really, it was fantastic. And you could see the artwork. We could hold the artwork. I can't yeah. tell you how inspiring that was. Or it was like coming into the coffee room at DC when Bernie was working on Swamp Thing. And every time you thought you did something good, you'd come in, Bernie would have some new pages. You look at him, you go, oh, crap. You have to go back and start working harder because he was always setting the bar higher and higher. We never caught that bar, but it was very inspiring. And that was one of the great things about, about being in New York at that time. So Chris was at that one bit, Chris was running, bumping into Chris help make one of what I regard one of my iconic stories in the Thor comic where I was able to work that out into a story that I'm still pretty proud of. So I miss, that's one of the things I miss. I mean, you, we all work at home. We all work alone anyway. Yeah. But I do miss the occasion to trip into the office and seeing all these Everybody. guys and seeing all this fantastic work coming through. It was great. That would be amazing. So mutant massacre, follow the mutants, Inferno, Weezy, how, <laughs> how did you keep track of creating these massive crossover events? Uh, well, with, we, we, they were created along with Chris. Yeah. And, the, and Walter and, you know, the, the occasional person who would wander in and want to play that particular game. Um, <laughs> so we, I, I guess we just did, we must have made a map of some kind. Right. Um, you we know, were a year apart. Sure the crossovers were a year apart. What, honey? The crossovers were a year apart, so you'd have one in the rearview mirror before you were working on the next one. And you could tell the story. I mean, Mutant Massacre was organic. The other ones were assigned. Right. Well, that we no, tell Inferno was also, um, well, that was right. where we were heading. I mean, we, we had all known that we were heading toward some, some conclusion that would put the X-Men and X-Factor kind of back together on the same team. Right. They mutant -y kind of team right. anyway. Um, hey, so part of what happened on that, I will jump in just for a sec. Part of what happened when X Factor was created, it was really created as, not as a story idea, but as a concept idea. In which right. the concept was, let's put the original X-Men back together. And the fact, for example, that Cyclops was an essential member of the X-Men at that time, didn't make any difference. He was essentially pulled out of that book and put over into X Factor. The fact right. that so, Gene was dead <laughs> didn't yeah, make right. any sense either. Gene was dead. And yeah. I don't know if the other guys were being published anywhere at the time. But, but what it meant was that Chris lost one of the major characters of his book, more or less overnight. And Gene, when they killed Gene off, uh, it had been made clear to Chris that she could never come back. Wow. She was never coming back. It was an editorial yeah. decision. She was never coming back. Is that with Jim Shooter? Yes. Yeah. Was it and, Jim Shooter I mean, the one that told him he needs to kill her? Yeah, well, Jim, I mean, he had a point. Yeah. John and Chris in the X-Men had done a story in which they each tried to top the other. <laughs> and 
So initially, Who the best? Jean Grey eat, or Phoenix eats the star to power herself up. That's in the plot. Yeah. And then when John draws the plot, it was Marvel style, John drew the plot. John knows a lot of old Marvel history. He's really an expert about all that old continuity, far more than I ever will be. And he remembered some Planet of Asparagus people from some old story. I don't even know if it was a monster story, one of the old monster comics, or if it was actually a Marvel comic. I mean, one of the Marvel superheroes. I don't remember. So he draws the asparagus people on their planet as the sun around their planet that they orbit around. That blows up. And then Chris gets that, and he writes a caption. He goes, okay, and he writes a caption. Five million, million asparagus people fry and call for the hollandaise sauce or whatever it was that you know, they really as did. they fry or something like that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no so, uh, and this got approved. It was going along. And then I think, I guess, maybe, do you know, Weezy, right before it was supposed to go out? Was that when Jim saw it? Or Jim, realized what Jim it was? saw it in the make ready stage, but it was already printed and ready to go out the door. Yeah. He, 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 in theory, saw it first in the pencil stage. And in theory, this is Jim Salakrup was the editor at that point. Yeah. Um, Salakrup said Shooter approved it. Shooter knew what was going to happen. Um, Shooter didn't remember approving it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so and, and, and essentially the way it came out, uh, Phoenix was a mass murderer. She destroyed, I mean, more than that, genocide, yeah. destroyed an entire planet. Um, it does. It takes her from being a good guy into a bad guy. Maybe an inadvertent bad guy, but definitely a bad guy. Right. So, um, yeah. So, so Chris was the the original plan was to devolve Jean down to like I don't know the intelligence of a five year old or something, um, to to deal with her uh, Phoenix powers. But um, in actual fact, uh, that really shooter said no no she's a mass murderer we have to do something she can either be put in hell forever she'll tough suffer eternal pain and damnation forever or you can kill her and chris said okay we'll kill her wow or something chris, so chris loves his characters he couldn't bear to see gene in hell i know and it was really the right decision um i mean shooter did give him that that option such as it was and um and killing her was the right choice it it's really like it made us, the X-Men, un untrustworthy. You couldn't look away from them because you wouldn't know what was going to happen next. I mean, that had been true of the X-Men. One of the great things about that book is you couldn't skip an issue. Yeah. Because something interesting happened every issue, and you didn't want to miss it. And yeah. that, that made it even. You know, you never knew who was going to live or die at that point. Yes, well, what that meant for X-Factor was that uh, Chris had already lost Gene. Then he had uh, oh, yeah, Blackhawk right. pulled away. And then over an X Factor, uh, by that time, was Psych already married by then? He was married and had a yes, kid. Yes, yeah, yeah, he was married to Madeline. He was married to Maddie, who was kind of a gene substitute. Right. Fans will hate to hear me say that, but it's true. Madeline Pryor, uh, yes. Madeline also Pryor, named, after, named after the lead singer of Steel Eye Span. For those of you who are old enough to remember Steel Eye Span, you can go wow. look that up. So uh, then uh, Shooter that. gave Bob Layton, who was the writer on X Factor, the idea, guy who had the idea, I think for X Factor, permission to bring Gene back. I think John maybe wrote the story or at least helped plot the story that brought Gene back. So Gene comes back. There were a back. lot of iterations of that story. There were a lot, a lot of, and I don't know the whole truth. I'm sure everybody you talked to would have a little different version. But the upshot was that Cyclops, Scott is married to a woman. He has a child by her. And suddenly he's over in X Factor hanging out with his old babe. Yeah. And that was really an editorial decision. That was not something that grew organically out of the character. The, the bad part about that was it made Scott this bent, weird, berserko guy that everybody, from having been the complete straight arrow, it was like, holy crap, what happened to Scott? And everybody was up in arms and infuriated. Still, they still discuss this on the web. I still see crap about this on the web. <laughs> I mean, the great thing is it made him this bent, weird character, which yeah. gave you all kinds of new stories you could do with him. So it really, I think it really launched the character in a whole series of stories. And part of the, what Chris and uh, Wheezy were doing over the first couple of years of X Factor, when she began writing it, was she and Chris were, were good friends. And of course they'd worked, he'd been her editor for a while on X-Men. Yeah. Is they began working toward kind of a solution for the Jean Grey, Maddie Pryor, Scott Summers 
dilemma that was really created editorially. It was not created organically out of the comics. It was right. an editorial, a set of editorial decisions that kind of left these characters in very strange places. And so they worked for about two years to get that undone. So, yeah, Inferno was what they were working toward, really, to try and get that resolved. When Chris did have this brilliant idea for making Maddie uh, a clone, a Jean Grey clone who had yeah. been, you know, taken and twisted, essentially. So it really, um, it, it, the name prior, totally. I mean, it's like a big, it's like a big Easter egg that, that Chris had planted without even realizing it, but he took advantage of it. He opened the Easter egg for everybody. So yeah. um, he, no, I, think, I don't think I knew that, honey. I never thought of that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, made, it, made, it makes it look I'm like we're having this talk. planning this all along. But um, yeah, no, well, Chris was really brilliant at that stuff. It's, it's interesting because you talked about that the idea was to devolve, is to devolve Jean Grey more back to a five-year-old. And when I read Inferno, for me, magic, Ileana is the main, is the, is the main protagonist in my mind. And, oh, and really sure, heart, absolutely. You know, and I read Magic, the miniseries, and I fell in love with that character. She's great, isn't she? Oh, she's amazing. And now hearing that is devolving her back to a seven-year-old is a way for Chris and you to get that original Phoenix storyline back into a fold? Or is that something that was... Because I got to tell you, Louise, I was so mad when you guys devolved her to a seven-year-old. I was like, I can't read this anymore. <laughs> he talks about it all the time. <laughs> I do from time but, to time. <laughs> but didn't it occur to you that down in Limbo, there was, were, there were, was magic of all... It, it, you know, because everything happened there simultaneously. Yeah. Because of the way Limbo worked. That there would have been the seven-year-old um, Ileana there. Right. I mean, honestly, in my mind, what happened was she went back to limbo. She took her seven-year-old un un unharmed self and put herself, put that child in the armor, and that was what had happened. She wasn't dead. She was down actually kicking ass and taking names in limbo. Uh, that's what I would have done with it originally. But yeah. I, I didn't want to say that because that spoils a storyline, potentially a pretty cool storyline for the future. It was a cool storyline. But then, you know, that I would, that, that I would pick up on yeah. and that people would be less mad at me. And I'd, I didn't blame them because she's a great character. And then, of course, I left. But I can't, I couldn't believe it took them, what, 30 years, 40 years to bring the character back. I know. It was ridiculous. I was she like, was how are you guys not bringing her back so much sooner? I mean. I mean, it I was love... set up. I never, I never kill a character or make or kill a character <laughs> unless I know how I'm bringing them back. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's just so interesting, too, because her power set was unique. You know, there wasn't a lot of people like her. And then plus the dark, the, you know, the dark child form was really cool looking and it was different. And then and then the way they portray her now is not the same. She's very much a goth teen angst and it's not the same person to me. And so it's like I asked I had uh, Andy. What's his, Andrew? Andy Pack the guy that does a lot of the setup for the Marvel movies, you mm -hmm. know, he creates the visuals and I asked him, I said, I, I want a magic. I'd love to have a magic one, but I want one from Inferno. I want, I want, I want that timeline. And he sent me one from the new one. <laughs> I was like, Oh, it's Andy Park. That, you know, Andy Park. That's right. They do that all the time. They do that with apocalypse. I think is they, yeah. they use maybe a later iteration of apocalypse that I, didn't really have mo proper motivation. I was appalled, yeah, actually, yeah. At the apocalypse from the movie. What did, what, did, what did they mess up on the motivation part? Everything? Apocalypse's plan all along was to create a race, a, a race of mutants. Um, in my own continuity, I think I, I actually sort of revealed <laughs> some of this in the X Factor for every series um, in the, the, the apocalypse backup. Um, yeah. he, he had been around forever, had been there when the Celestials came and judge the earth the first time. And he thought, oh shit, we're gonna have to be really powerful to fight these guys off when they come back. And that was his motivation to, to move forward, creating you know, more and more powerful humans, mutants, um, as time went along. Um, when X Factor was strong enough to defeat him, I mean, first of all, his motivation is never, oh boy, I wanna rule the world. His motivation is to test the beings he's created 
see what survives and then bre breed it to make him, to make them, to, to create a stronger generation. Um, he, when X Factor beat him, he should have said, yes, I've won. Yeah. These characters are strong enough to take me. Let's see if maybe I can make them even stronger. And that's where that should, it should have been that story. Those are the best villains. The ones the that don't think they're story. wrong. Yeah. I think the ones that feel like they're doing right and they're, they're creating something they're like, like I thought they, they did a good job on Thanos on, on the Marvel and the new ones. I, I like Starlin cause we had Starlin on a little bit ago and we talked about Thanos, you know, and he, he did, he said he thought they, they like, he liked what they did in the movies and how they betray everything. They're hoping that they bring the whole aspect of death in so you can get some more of that in. But at the same time, the fact that he's doing this, and feels like he's doing something so egregious, but in his heart, he feels like this is the only way to get this right. Uh, I, I don't know. Those always make the best villains. And Magneto's another one. Chris's Magneto yeah. was the same oh, yeah. thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's, he's just trying to, again, I guess in, in that way, maybe uh, he and Magneto and Apocalypse are on the same side. <laughs> yeah, in a lot of ways, right? The, yeah. Just oh, yeah. Order of magnitude. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> It's so, just, just lived a little longer. Yeah, just a, just a, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> so, Walt, you are been working on Ragnarok now for what since twenty seventeen? I think it oh, was longer about about four four and a half years. I think I'm yeah I'm much slower than I used to be. <laughs> that like I I I kind of fanboyed out on you when you first brought it up because I I absolutely love what you're doing with that. Well, thank you. Where did, where, where did this motivation come from to, to kind of go back and start re, not redoing Thor, obviously, but doing a new iteration of the Norse mythology? Because, I mean, you kind of did the quintessential Thor book there for so long and then come back and, and kind of write these new stories. It's, it's wonderful. But where did, where did this come from? Well, I've always loved Norse mythology. I was a kid. My parents had a book in their, our home library. Uh, from the late 1800s, which when I was born, wasn't as long ago as it is now, but it was still a long time ago. And uh, I read it. I loved it. Um, it was an adult book. It wasn't a kid book. It was an adult book. Um, had quotes from the elder Edda and the younger Edda inside some of the poetry. Um, yeah. So I loved that stuff from the beginning. Um, I discovered Marvel Comics, discovered Thor was the first comic I discovered. For, uh, Journey of Mystery 113, The Return of the Grey Gargoyle, was the first Marvel superhero book I read. Uh, nice. I went nuts that the Thor was in a comic book. Uh, I didn't care about the continuity. I didn't care his hair wasn't red. I didn't care he didn't have you know iron gauntlets on his hand. Um, I thought it was fabulous. And so I read it and really enjoyed it. I started reading it shortly thereafter. Um, and then, uh, as is usual with books, if you write them for a while, at least for me, probably for Wheezy, you should can tell you, I end up with a lot more ideas in my idea file than I'm ever able to put in the comic book. Um, fragments of stories, ideas for stories, all sorts of stuff. You use what you can, but you can't use all of it, mostly. And uh, so I, but I finished up the book. I, I finished what I could do at the time. I, I was on the book for just a little under four years. And uh, if you include the Baltimore miniseries, I had 48 issues that I wrote, and I drew a little over half of those. And then with the other stuff, I love doing the FF. I love doing Orion, my favorite, one of my favorite books. Um, but I, about, well, 15, 16, 17, 18 years ago now, a long time ago now, Scott Doombeer, who was an editor at Wildstorm at the time, maybe the group, the head editor, editor-in-chief at Wildstorm. Oh, yeah. Scott is an old friend of mine. We go back to his pre-comics days. He was an art dealer in comics originally, ended up in the editorial side, uh, and is now an editor for IW. But back when he was at Wildstorm, he called me up, it was Image, and he wanted to know if I had any interest in doing a... Maybe I want to do my own book about the Norse myths. And I thought that would be a really cool idea. Uh, I thought, yeah, I could see doing my own book of the Norse myths. I'll have to think about that. And I thought about it for 15 years. And 15 <laughs> years later, I, I had a lot of work to do. I, I got the other work out of the way. And I um, literally, I was driving down the road not far from the house here, uh, heading over to Borders. That's how long ago this was. Borders bookstores were still around. We had a real yeah. nice one our from us. I and still miss it. And uh, I was driving there, and I, I had an idea for Thor being locked in a, at the bottom of a dungeon and uh, imprisoned 
And maybe by Loki, uh, maybe there was a doppelganger. I had some other stuff going on. But it was interesting. It was sort of like a, just a, it was an idea for, a, for almost a visual idea more than it was anything like a story. Yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. I, maybe I'd, I'd had that somewhere along the way. Then when I was driving, actually, what happened was I suddenly, I was, I was turning over my mind. I was, you know, thinking about whatever you think about when you're driving. And I suddenly thought, wow, what if Ragnarok has already happened? Mm-hmm. Because in the Norse myths, Ragnarok, the Twilight of the Gods, is the ultimate battle where the gods and their enemies get together and they eventually kill each other. There are a few survivors, but the old gods are all dead. The great old enemies are also dead. And uh, the children of the gods survive. And in the poetry, there is a little suggestion that maybe evil survives as well. It's, the Norse poetry is very spare, and we yeah. don't understand what all of it means, I don't think. But uh, I thought, what happens if Ragnarok has already occurred? What happens if Thor wasn't there? That means the Midgard serpent doesn't get killed. And the Midgard serpent so powerfully helps his brothers and his allies, and they kill all the gods and they win. And the bad guys take the day. <laughs> what kind of a world does that leave behind? Right. And so I, you know, and that kind of combined with my idea of Thor in this dungeon. And so I, I never made it to borders because I've learned the hard way that if you have an idea, uh, well, let me rephrase that. If I have an idea, <laughs> if I don't write it down, it's like a dream. It's going to go away. I think, well, it's such a fabulous idea. How can I possibly not remember this? And yeah. you go off and you'll do your errands, you'll do whatever you have to do. You come back three hours later and you go, well, oh, crap. I had something that involved a paper clip and a slice <laughs> of pizza. And it's just, it's just gone. So I just turned around. I learned that lesson after all these years. I turned around. I drove home. Wheezy was out right then. Came in, sat down, started typing. And in about an hour, I had the basic outline for the world in which my original idea of Thor in prison could be set. And I began developing it from that. But I, I wrote down all the essential stuff I was thinking of right then so I could remember. I talked to Scott, and uh, he was game to do it. By that time, uh, Wallace had been bought by DC. Scott was a group editor for them for a while there. Yeah. And then went over to IDW and began working at IDW. And so I called them up to IDW. They do creator-owned books there, yep. and, as well as others. They're a and, great uh, company. I, he liked the idea, and that's, that was really how Ragnarok came about. I went through several iterations of the name originally, but Ragnarok seemed like a good name because I kind of feel as long as the last god isn't dead yet, Ragnarok is still ongoing. And so my book is about the ongoing Ragnarok that's going across the, what's that's left of the nine worlds. That's a great tagline. As long as the last god is still alive, Ragnarok is still ongoing. It's just well, you know, that was my my the first series of stories. The first story arc was called Last God Standing. Yeah, so that's kind of how I view that. Now I know Jeff loves that book as well, and he's got a few questions he wants to ask you about it. All right. Yes. Um. So my my first question is. It seems like a lot of Norse mythology has had like a resurgence in uh, popular culture. Do do you credit um? Uh, Thor movies, you credit maybe just a, a, a interest maybe more in old Viking history or the TV show. Like, what do you think credits the uh, resurgence of uh, that mythology? You no, know, it's hard to say. I, I have to say, I'd probably start it with maybe the first Thor film what was that 2011, 2012. Yeah. And, uh, but I, but one of these, you know, stuff, if you can get it rolling down the hill like a snowball, it just gets bigger as time goes by. And so I don't know, but, you know, if we could all do that, we'd all be doing it. I have no idea how to do it. I would do that with Rag with my book if I could do it like that. I can't. <laughs> I sell 12 copies, but I have a great time doing it. <laughs> so, uh, but I think probably the movies, the Marvel character, and then and the movies out of that, the movie be- really began that. I don't know that the program Vikings goes back before the Thor film. You guys might. I think it's afterwards. Yeah, maybe sure. I, I think for several seasons now, or a bunch of seasons. So... All of that stuff became more interesting and more part of the popular consciousness in a way that I'm, you know, I have no idea how that worked. Um, I keep hoping I'll pick up my book as a result. <laughs> oh, look, it's more Norse Smith stuff. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I think that has something to do with it. Now, but mythology has so many great pantheons. You have the Greek pantheon, the Roman pantheon, Egyptians. What makes um, the Norse one so much more special to you, like personally? 
because they all die in the era. (laughs) (laughs) They have a great, great final battle, and that's they have their own apocalypse without the, not so much the Christian underpinning, but uh, at least as a kid, I thought that, and I read a lot of mythology. I read, I read uh, Greek and Roman mythology, Egyptian mythology, which I thought was great. Um, but there, the, I think the Norse myths, at least for me, offer two things. One, they all die when it's at the end of it. In yeah. a, a great battle. The actual poem, the Velaspa, that contains the story of Ragnarok, it also contains the story of, uh, of the birth of the universe. It's the beginning and the end. It's the Alpha and Omega of the Norse myths. It's not very long. It's easy to read. Uh, little quatrains, or whatever they'd be called in Viking poetry. And... Um, the, I think Ragnarok, the whole thing's maybe two and a half, three pages long, but it's really riveting. It's very spare. It's just great stuff. So one of the things about the Norse myths, I think that's appealing, is that everybody dies at the end, and that does that is very dramatic. Uh, and a lot of the other myths, that's not true. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And the other thing that the Norse myths offer is a very fragmentary existence. We have a lot of Greek myths, and we have a lot of Roman myths. I don't know the volume of Egyptian myths and other places. A lot of other places we have, I wouldn't say a complete set of stories from them, but a lot of stories from them. The Norse myths are really in about two books, the Elder Edda and the Younger Edda. There are some other sagas. There's some other stuff here and there. But really, and even the Elder Edda, only half of that's myths, half is uh, legends of, of Atli and other stories. So, in a way, there's a lot of room to maneuver. Um, you can really take these ideas, which are incomplete. There are a number of stories for which you only have a few, like a reference or two. There are a couple of poems of something called, what they're called, Fightings. And they are, where, that's like trash talk, Norse, tra- Viking trash talk. And, uh, for example, uh, Thor is going home, and he has to cross a river. Back to Asgard, has to cross a river. And there's a ferryman on the far side of the river, an old guy. And Thor says, hey, ferryman, get over here. Give me a ride. And the ferryman insults Thor. And Thor gets kind of hot out of the collar. He's a, has a, he's a choleric temperament in Norse myths. He begins yelling at the, Vic, at the uh, old guy. And the old guy yells back at him. He just, just reams him out. Just gives him all kinds of crap. And we don't know what all the references are. Loki does the same thing in, another, in a different poem, where he just chastises the gods. It's not long before he gets becomes a really bad guy. And he abuses the hospitality and is really nasty. And he makes reference to a bunch of stories. We don't have anything else in those stories. We have his word for it in a very uh-huh. fragmentary way, and that's it. So in the Norse myths, at least as a font of creative energy, you can read through them, and then there are a million ways to go. I mean, that's true of any myth, really. But it's really true of the Norse myths, where you can, you can have a grounding in them, but you still have a lot of streets and avenues and boulevards that you can ride down and, yeah. uh, and, and find all kinds of neat things. So uh, I think also the other thing I was going to say is because the history, of, because as Vikings got more popular, a lot more information about Vikings out there now, about the Viking culture. Turns out yeah. they weren't just raiders. They weren't just <laughs> weavers from the north that went around killing priests mm-hmm. and stealing the stuff out of uh, monasteries. They were explorers. They were culture bringers. I mean, I already knew they, you know, they were the Varangian guard the emperor of Constantinople had a Varangian guard of Vikings as his personal bodyguard. And Harold Hadrada, who was the main, one of the main guys in that group, apparently was about six feet six, which, you know, that'd be tall now in yeah. I don't know, 1100 or I don't know, 1066. So 1050, 1040, that would be incredibly tall back then. Yeah, it'd be and giant. There's, there's a lot of other stuff in the Viking. You go on the web now, I'm always getting notices of new finds about Viking artifacts or Viking this viking that a lot more of it so again it's that snowball there's a lot more of it out there than there used to be and you if you're interested you can find a ton of stuff now that 20 30 years ago you would never have been able to find now have you read the norse mythology book by neil gaiman and what did you think i have not i do have a copy i haven't read a lot of neil's stuff um neil and i and for what little i know we seem to mine some of the same territory i real neil has done it much more successfully than I have done. <laughs> but uh, but that although the Norse myths are, so I haven't read his books, partly because I don't want to have an idea, and then I read one of Neil's stories, 
I discover he's already done it. Then right. I wouldn't be able to. Now, maybe that wouldn't happen. I'm, I'm not saying it would happen. I have no idea. I may flatter myself that I would have an idea like one of Neil's. But <laughs> the idea is that uh, I don't want to. I'd have to put that story aside. I, could, I couldn't use that story then. So yeah. mostly I haven't read his stuff. I've read a few of his comics. Um, and I know Neil's a big fan of uh, you know, uh, Cabell, James Branch Cabell. Uh, I bought a, a, a big Cabell set of books many, many years ago. So we, as in, we had mined some of the same territory. Nor the mythology, with Norse mythology, I will probably read it. I did pick it up um, because there are so many Norse mythology books out there. I've read so many of them. It'll be harder to accuse me of stealing Neil's stuff <laughs> if I read that book. So well, I, I, I do have I it. it. I will read it. Weezy read oh. it. I read it, and actually, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's not very elaborated. It's pretty much Neil's retelling of what we know of the Norse myths. So I, I told Walter I thought it'd be safe for him to read it. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, I actually I just have one more question for Walt. Um, sure. You did for Ragnarok a jam session with Stan Sakai, who I'm really a huge fan of as well. So I just would love to know how that came about and what was it like to work with Stan? Oh, it's okay. fabulous. I mean, I've known Stan for years uh, in interviews in the past. I'll do it again. I get asked every so often, what comics do you read? And I don't read many comics anymore. Uh, I look at a few here and there for to see what the artwork looks like. Most of them I'm in the store. So they can look at me and say, Simonson, this is not a library. I go, okay. So I'm, <laughs> but, uh, but mostly... Uh, the one comic I have read for years and years is Yosagi Yojimbo by Stan. It's my favorite comic. I read it for the same reason I read Carl Barks' duck work back in the 50s as a kid. They are good stories. They are well told. He has quite a wide range of stories from stuff that's full of tragedy and pathos. Yeah, I love them too. Funny stories here and there. So we've been friends for a long time. The advantage for me is that Stan puts out these little sketchbooks every so often. He takes to conventions and he kindly gives me one of them when I show up. So I have all these Stan Sakai sketchbooks. Which oh, is that's great. awesome. But I just, you know, I think cool. I'm guessing when, well, what happened was uh, for reasons I don't know, I don't have any, I have no, what were you talking about earlier? Uh, re re reveals on this program. I have no <laughs> reveal on this. Uh, this uh, but but you know, Yosagi Ojimbo moved from Dark Horse over to IDW. And uh, so in the beginning of that process, Scott, I don't think he's, he's not editing Yosagi. But of course, he knows uh, Stan. And he got a hold of me and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a jam cover with uh, Stan. I said, sure, I'd love to do a jam cover with Stan. So Stan did a complete layout of the whole thing, um, in which, of course, he made Yasagi, you know, it's a very loose little drawing, but it's Yasagi the way Stan draws him, clearly. And um, he inked some of it, including all the Ragnarok bits on one on half. The, it was a double page spread. So it was split down the middle, but the drawing went all the way across. He didn't just ink stuff on one half. He inked a little stuff across the border, across the gutter, rather, out of the other side, across the fold, and, um, and then left about half of it for me, including Asagi. And there are a bunch of these demon warriors that are, I've used a lot of the dead, the Draugr, in, in Ragnarok. And yeah. he's, so he included a bunch of those. Some of, them are in, some of them are in Japanese armor, and some of them were like half inked. You know, I don't know what those flat armored plates that they are not plates, but those woven things on their shoulders are. He would ink one of those, but the other one was left for me. And part of the figure be inked, part of it wouldn't be inked. But he went ahead and inked all of Thor. He inked part of the Midgard serpent, the part in the front cover, which is most of the coils. Left, I think that was it. Maybe he inked the head. I can't remember anymore. But he sent it to me then, or it was sent to me, uh, and I inked the rest of it. I did have a question. My question was, I'm I'm not a bad style swiper if I work at it. I don't do much anymore. It's too hard. It's just, it, you know, it's hard to be a good forger. You have to work too. I'm much, it's much easier to draw my own stuff. So <laughs> I asked about, about Sagi and I said, well, you want me to, should I just ink this or draw this and ink it like a Stan Sakai Yasagi? And the answer from Stan and from Scott was, no, 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 draw your own, draw your own. Yeah. So I went back and I re-penciled the Asagi on the back cover um, to make my own version of an armored rabbit. So I did that. Uh, and then ink everything else in the drawing. And that's, that's how it came about. If you buy the comic that has the cover in it or, or on it, um, there, and even some of the other ones, there's a, a plate, a couple of pages in the back that include a couple of plates that show, I think, the original pencil layout from Stan, and then below the inked version. And someone went through carefully, some digital wizard at IDW, and they dropped all the black lines out 
some of them in red, and I think some of them in blue. And all the ones in red were inked, I'm going to say by Stan, but I forget which color was which. But anyway, it broke the drawing into what I inked and what Stan inked. So you can go back and actually look at the cover and see which of us had what to do with which the characters, even though That's they're all really cool. Color. That's how that came about. And it was really, it was a lot of fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. Louise, I got to ask you, do you like, do you prefer Wheezy or Louise? It makes no difference. Makes no I, difference. People, most, most everybody calls me Wheezy, but um, I have friends who think Wheezy is such a hideous nickname that they call me Louise. So they didn't call me pretty much anything. <laughs> I, I got to ask you, what was it like killing Superman? Um, pretty much like killing anybody. I don't think we, we, I, we, did not realize when we did it yeah. that it was going to be that big a deal because we've all done terrible things to characters. I mean, you know, that the, the group who were on the Superman books were all pretty much experienced and had, you know, long histories of doing terrible things to characters. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was, it, we thought it made a good story and that the aftermath would be a good story. Yeah, um, you know, for a friend and stuff. It did. I don't think we knew that it would be what it became. Um, so that I, I think what it was like was we wanted to make it as good as we possibly could. You know, we hoped people would like the story. We, we hoped they'd buy into it. Yeah. And, you know, be all, you know, horrified as one hopes that one will be when a favorite character dies. And then, you know, we knew he would get better because... He's in Superman. Fortnite. He's not going to be able to <laughs> exactly. let us just do him in completely. Right. Um, so I don't think we thought ahead in that way. I think the idea was to just to make a, a really good story, to show what the world would be like if there wasn't any Superman. It's, it's an interesting, when you, when you read that storyline, it's interesting to see Doomsday come in and have this epic battle. But at the same time, I don't know. Be, the way you guys set it up, it felt like you knew that this was coming, you know? There, were, there really wasn't, like, find out what happens next week on, you know what I mean? It was, everybody knew this is the death of Superman storyline, and then when it actually happens, you're still feeling like, oh, wow, they actually, you know, for, for, un, for any uncertain turns, they actually did it. And then they didn't just bring Superman back a month later. You guys took a long time to actually bring him back, which, got, you know, which brought into the whole mythos and the whole like concept of wow they really killed superman mm -hmm. was this like was that a conscious effort on not bringing him back for so long or just like let's just let this simmer for a while um well i think there were, there were uh, several things where it worked there yeah. um uh, when we realized how much i don't know reaction there was yeah to the death of Superman. I, I, I think at that point, that's when Mike Carlin thought it would actually be really cool to cancel the book books for a couple of months and then, and, and let it, you know, play into this, this belief everyone had that he was really dead, that we were. That's simmer, you know, that's simmer. <laughs> yeah, you're, and then one of the things that interested me and I think some of the others was that to do a world without Superman. Yeah. Um, and what would happen? And that's where the idea of the four different people stepping in and being becoming Superman um, came from. Yeah. Uh, and we were, at that point, I think all of us were really glad to not be working in complete lockstep like we had been for the death stories, which I think were very successful as, as a story, you know, as an ongoing, you know, continuing story with each book as a chapter. Yeah. But I think we were feeling a little crowded and we kind of all, we wanted to have a little time apart to breathe. So, um, you know, we were really glad to have that as an option. And then, you know, th but then of course we had to bring Superman back because first of all, you can't just go around killing Superman. <laughs> um, we had to then do it in a way that didn't feel like a cheat. And yeah. that was our real concern was that we didn't want the readers to think that we were I don't know, toying with them. It's really, it's an interesting re relationship that as creators you have with your audience, which is you want, you, you make up stories and you want them to buy into the stories and to really believe it, to feel the, the emotion of the stories as things happen. Yeah. But 
you, I don't know, I actually felt kind of bad when I was finding out people were buying lots of copies of The Death of Superman because they thought they could, you know, hide them under their bed and then, you know, sell them, you know, 15 years later and put their kid through college with them. Right. And it was like, right. no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> you can't say that to them because right. we all were under a, I don't know, some sort of a legal thing where we weren't allowed to even talk about what would happen in the future. We couldn't. Yeah. NDA. We couldn't reveal anything. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was like, a, it was an interesting time, just this kind of dichotomy. I mean, it was really cool that everybody believed our story and actually liked that, liked the story itself. And then I don't think anybody was really mad when we brought Superman back either. Yeah. I think they were happy with the, you know, the way the story played out. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. There's only a few characters in comics that I think you could run that story with and have that impact. I think Superman, I think Batman, and I think Spider-Man. Yeah. I think those are the only three to me that you could have a death of and people will be, if you don't bring them back, you're going to have hysteria. <laughs> yes. and, and then, but, so you have to bring them back. It's, it's, yeah. My mom bought me that book for the same reason. Like, I, you know, she, she went and, and stood in line at the comic book store. And if you know my mom, she's super religious, super conservative. This is not some, you know, she hated me reading comic books. She didn't hate it, but she didn't understand it. She saw my Wolverine miniseries when I was 12 years old. And it has an iconic first, uh, that cover where he's got his yeah. claws out. And she's just like, that looks so violent. Why do you have to read that stuff? And it's just... It was so funny, but she went down and bought me the death of Superman without, I didn't even know it, you know, and, well, it's, it's and for the same kind of reason. She thought it was gonna be worth a ton of money because she thought Superman wasn't coming back, you right. know, it, that this is the end of it. Was and it was all over the news. So that's funny. It was a slow yeah. news day. You know, these yeah. things happen. Um, it was in Newsweek. <laughs> I know. Yeah, at the same time that, I think it was, was it Newsweek that had the ad where the same ad in the that's same magazine. The issue where the show Superman breaking his chains and Ener Energizer batteries last as long as Superman. <laughs> Superman kind of funny. That is in the story, so yeah. That didn't work. <laughs> I, well, one thing about the death of Superman I really liked, which I don't know who noticed it, but if you go back and look at the last four issues, the, the countdown to the death, yeah. the, uh, the fourth issue is it's all four panel pages. The next issue is all three panel pages. Oh. It was all two panel pages. Yep. And the last issue was all splash pages. Yeah, we yeah. did that. That was deliberate. I did not notice that at all. I'm, that's awesome. Johnny, you never told me this. <laughs> well, that's, that's legit one of my favorite stories of all time. I, I was, I think I was like 12 or 13 when that story came out. My dad was buying, my dad was a huge Superman. Younger than that. It came, what year did it come out? 92? 93. About. 92, 93, something like that. I was 11, 12 years old then. Yeah. And uh, my dad was a huge, has always been a huge Superman fan. So he was, he'd been buying the books monthly, all of them for years. He read them all. And I learned to read by reading Superman and Batman and Wolverine. And, uh, you know, that was like one of our favorite series to read. And then when it actually happened, he, my dad never believed it was going to stick. He's like, no, they'll bring him back. He's like, give it a year. He'll be back. He'll be back. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. But he, um, he, was, he, was, he was a Superman fan from the, from the 50s on, you know. Fanatic. Yeah. Uh, and um, he actually had a collection one time of Superman one through four twenty three that he had put together. Wow. Yeah, um, but yeah, it was it was we, we when I would at twelve years old, or whatever eleven years old, we'd even talk about this whole storyline. And I think I think that book, the the collected version of the Death of, is probably the book I've read the most of any comic book ever in my life. <laughs> well, then I'm glad we worked so hard to make it readable. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I, I love the whole thing. It's one you of my know, favorites. I, I actually kind of. But felt a little guilty because I'm I'm talking to people who read it when they were, you know, six and seven years old, and it's really very violent. It is. Yeah. I mean, this you've got this big guy with these these bony bony protrusions on his <laughs> body beating. I mean, the beating he and Superman are beating each other to death. Yeah. I mean, I was I actually, but the more we worked in it, the queasier I got. It. <laughs> I actually was like, oh dear, the children of America are going to read this. I know adults do, but I knew there would be kids, and I thought, oh, is this this is horrible? And years later, I asked, I've I've talked to you know the fans who come up, fans of that book, and I say, so how old were you when you read it? I was six. Oh God, did we scar you for life? Like, oh no, we loved it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so my conscience is somewhat assuaged anyway. <laughs> well, well, my question is, when you were going to kill Superman, why did you choose a new character? Or what was the decision making between making a new character versus like an, a classic rogues gallery character, like Luther do it or Brainiac do it? 
you know, everybody, because they've been up against Superman a million times. I mean, we were actually, I don't know, maybe not exactly bored with the characters, but we thought if somebody was going to be powerful enough to kill Superman, that had to be somebody new. Yeah. And we wanted them to be, to come out of the blue with, we wouldn't know what their backstory was. It was just it was almost like a force of nature, like a, like a, a, a tornado yeah. would come in and completely engulf Superman. There'd be like no, no way of dealing with the character other than just to confront him. Yeah. And, you know, do, do everything you could to stop him before he kind of went through, you know, the United States, the world destroying it. When you're mapping out that story and you're, and like you had mentioned earlier, creating the situation dictates the kind of character that you're going to create for that situation. Mm -hmm. What was the catalyst of bringing in doomsday? When you wrote it, you're like, this is how this is going to happen. Well, I mean, the, the catalyst was we wanted a character who could kill Superman. Yeah. Because killing Superman was the point of, that particular story. <laughs> and um, we wanted a character who we hadn't seen before. Yeah. So we, we have these, you, I suppose everybody knows at this point that we had these big Superman meetings where everybody who worked on the book got together um, once a year and we would plot out the continuity for the next year. Oh, that's cool. Um, we had been working toward the wedding of Clark and Lois. That was going, and we did, we worked on that for a couple of days. Yeah. And we came up with this huge, whole continuity, all on this chart, this big old chart. And we brought Jeanette Kahn in to say it. And she said, oh yeah, that's great. He said, you can't do it. <laughs> because we have a TV show, Lois and Clark, that's going to be happening. And you can't, it would be confusing to the readers to have a, a Lois and Clark married or and 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 and, and uh, just beginning to date. So right. we said, so they you know throughout two days of three days of work, however many days we had taken, and uh, Jerry Ardway said as usual, no, you know everybody's looking at each other for ideas. It's like, oh my god, what are we going to do? And because we still needed to do a year's worth of a new year's worth of continuity, and Jerry Ardway says, like he did every year, eh, let's kill him. <laughs> yeah yeah let's kill him because we were a little pissed off you know <laughs> we were in the mood so um that was that was the catalyst for for the death of superman was that we couldn't do the wedding of superman yeah <laughs> so we did that instead so we can't yeah, do the wedding. Yeah. <laughs> yep yep it worked out um and then then from that you know we we, who, who could kill Superman? Okay, and then we came up with this idea about a character who comes out of the blue, who's yeah. so very powerful. Um, we had a contest among the artists. <laughs> everybody sat down, and this is how this is how it, it was done. And in, in five, everybody had five minutes to draw a character who could kill Superman. Oh my god! And Dan Jerkins drew Doomsday pretty much as he appeared. Everybody else drew other things. I, I wish that we had copies. Somebody must have copies of the other yeah. drawings somewhere. Um, yes. And we all liked, like Dan's best. So we said, okay, I don't know where the name Doomsday came, came from, but I know that we then decided to do a doom, doom, doom prelude in the different continuities that we were doing leading up to, you know, Doomsday breaking out of his, his containment and then, uh, you know, trashing the world. So, um, and then, you know, they beat each other to death. Countdown, you know, four, four, three, two, one, splash pages, and then he dies at the end of it. What did, what did you think of Doomsday and the, uh, this, this, is it Scott Snyder? Zach, Zach Snyder. Yeah. Yeah. Zach Snyder. Yeah, Zack Snyder and the, uh, the Dawn of Justice movie. I didn't see the Dawn of Justice movie. Okay. I, <laughs> we, don't, we don't see a lot of those movies. <laughs> and, Nothing wrong with that. I, I, they weren't doing my Superman. No. I mean, my Superman is, you know, he's, 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 you know, truth, justice in the American way. Yep. And their Superman, they were trying to do Batman. I don't know what the heck they were doing. Yeah. But I, I saw the first, the first Superman movie. The Man where, of Steel. Where yeah. they had. I mean, With Cavelli. Was that the Man of Steel? Who was that? He was in. 
one of the one Cavelli was the Superman. And we yeah, saw Man of Steel. Yeah, Man, Man of Steel, yeah. Of and and he's knocking over buildings, killing people. And, you know, Superman takes the fight into space. If he's going to have to fight all these bad guys, you know, they, he takes yeah. it off. Every child in America knows that. Yeah. It's, you know, you don't just... I mean, there were almost, there were so many, don't get me started on that movie. I'm, I'm as <laughs> down on that one as I am on the Apocalypse movie. Worst maybe. Well, um, I, will, I will say this. We came out of that film, <laughs> walked out of the, as we were walking down the aisle out of the theater, and we looked at each other and we said, we both said, I swear. Yeah. Boy, that was really loud. <laughs> that was our Superman comment. Yeah. Uh, See, to me, it's that you can't beat Richard Donner's Superman and then the Richard Donner cut of Superman 2 with Christopher Reeve because uh, Reeve is the epitome. And I, and I, uh, I loved Superman Returns with... Um, oh, Johnny. Ralph. Yeah. Ralph. Yeah, I, I, I loved his portrayal of Superman. I wish they would have just continued that, that line. But uh, Man of Steel, was, to me, was a, was a re- it was a remake of Superman 2. And it's like, eh, I've, I've seen this already, but it was done so much better in, the, in 1980. So <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> you know, you, you don't have a scene where Superman lets his father die. Thank you. Yeah, oh my thank God, you. I hate that scene. Yeah. I mean, it's like stupid. Any child in America could have knows that he would have, you know, he could have created some system whereby he gets sucked up in the air and grabs his father and they get, oh my goodness, dropped on a, a, yeah. a, a, a haystack or something. And gosh, they're fine. Yep. Um, yep. You don't have a, a, a system where his dad is saying, oh no, you don't save the children and they were dying in the school bus because they'll find out your, about your power. You know, right, right. I'm sorry. I don't know. That's not Superman. Never mind. <laughs> 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 the idiot wrote that stuff, but they didn't understand Superman anymore. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bitch, moan, moan, complain. This is that that <laughs> that's fan stuff. <laughs> that, was, that was enough for us in the Superman movie department. So we haven't seen the ones after. Oh yeah, I, 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 got, I got pissed off at that, and that was the end. You know, yeah, t- I don't, I don't people do. getting pissed off when they do something that you think is going to be terminal. Right, right. I, well, that whole scene where where his dad dies in the tornado. It just doesn't make any sense. Cause it's like, like when, when Donner does it in the first one, he dies of a heart attack. He doesn't understand his powers the whole way. He couldn't save him. Right. It made so much sense. You know right. what I mean? And yeah. then to do that again in a situation where he could have just, I don't know it, that, that I liked the movie the first time I watched it. Then the more I watched it, the, you know, the second time I watched it, I started nitpicking it. And then Johnny is such a huge Superman fan. And he goes, yeah, but what, did you think about this, this, and this? And then it was like, oh, my God. They, they didn't do a Superman movie. I don't know what they did. <laughs> and, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Superman as I understand Superman. Anyway. And that's too bad because I like, like Superman. I like Henry Cavill. I, I, thought, I think he looks the part. I yeah. thought he was a good-looking Superman. Yeah, he's a good-looking, yes. but he doesn't do Clark Kent. Like Brandon Routh. Clark Kent portrayal is so good and you have to be able to play both because you're two different characters that's right you're essentially playing two roles and if you can't that's the same with Christopher Reeve oh when yeah he, when he was Clark Kent oh my he put the glasses on and you could say oh yeah he's just wearing glasses how did nobody know but his whole mannerism changes his whole when he, when he was in Lois apartment he took off his glasses and neatened his hair and straightened up you're going god damn maybe it would work yeah, yeah. right I know it, it it Yep. Oh, I love it. I love it. So when you guys look back at your long careers, is there something that you cherish more than anything else? Or are you just happy to be a part of all the stories and all the work that you've been a part of? Well, I'm happy I got into comics and met Wheezy. That's, That's cool. probably the best part. That's awesome. Good answer. Also, That's a good that answer. answer. <laughs> we, we were doing a lot of our comics in the golden age of comics, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. The 80s and the 90s were just the best, particularly the 80s. Yeah. You know, it was, um, you know, it was, it, we, because everybody lived in New York and you knew everybody. And, um, you know, it was just, it was fun. It was more a village as well as, you know, working in, in an industry. So yeah. um, that was. Also, also, when you were given a book, I was given a book like Thor. I mean, Thor wasn't, the, the, Thor wasn't doing very well. Mark Grunewald gave me the book. He was the editor. And he said, do whatever you want. You have carte blanche. If you want to kill him, kill him. If you want, and then nobody was killing characters like that back then. 
You right. want to tell them you want to do have somebody else find the hammer, you want to do anything, well, whatever, whatever. They, but anything you want to do is fine. And back then, if you were a creator and you were given a book, you pretty much had free reign to do what you wanted to do. You could tell the stories you wanted to tell. And we all knew what the bubble was for mainstream comics. Yeah. I, I don't have any real interest in being the revolutionary who breaks that, that boundary. I don't care. I just want to tell stories I like and stories I hope our readers will like. But yeah. you really could tell the stories. And, ne- and so what I said elsewhere, my view of comics is that back then, creativity was from the bottom up. Now, creativity is the top down. Now there are all these crossovers, a lot of mandated stories. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure what it would be like to be a new guy getting into comics now. And some of the guys on top, I mean, they're friends of mine. I know who they, I know them. I respect their work. I'm not that interested in telling their stories. Right. They want to, you know, to. I I have a little bit. I did a commandy a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, but it's not, it's very different structurally than it was. I don't just mean the business or the movies or any of that stuff, but the creative aspects of doing comics are quite different now. And I do think that Weez and I came through kind of a golden period where you could make enough money to make a living pretty reasonably, and you could tell the stories you wanted to tell, and you could do the drawings you wanted to draw. That's it cool. was great. It yeah. was just great. I, and royalties came in. What's that? Royalties and came royalties, in. That was nice, too. Yeah, my, my income went up by a third in about 1982 or 83, when they, 82, I think, when they introduced royalties. Was that, so, that was Shooter for Marvel, right? Shooter for Marvel, Shooter and Hobson, I think, for Marvel. Yeah. And Paul Levitz, uh, DC did it first. Paul, I think Paul Levitz, probably Jeanette, uh, maybe Orlando. I'd have to ask those guys. Um, but they were probably responsible for it. And uh, it, made, it made a difference in my income, a significant difference. So that was very cool. Uh, I mean, now there's so many comics. The royalty checks, I just got a check, actually, for $5.30. So... <laughs> I'm I'll a cup of coffee. Spread it all in one place, but we have a milkshake place near here that makes great malted milks, and nice. it's four and a half bucks for a good malted milk. So I'll spend most of that check for a malted milk. I'll be happy with it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I like it. Well, guys, we've been on for like over an hour and a half. We oh, have been. So we yeah. have. Yeah, and it's been a wonderful conversation. I. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been awesome hearing all the stories. And I learned a lot today of things I had no idea about. So wow. that's always fun. <laughs> it's been our pleasure. We had a lot of fun. As we, it was fun. Thank you, guys. All right. You Thank guys you guys so fun. much. A lot of fun. But first, for anybody watching, if there's like weird frame rate shit, Sorry. If you're listening, I have no idea what we're talking about, but Zoom. It, it's yeah. Zoom. It's the interwebs. It's Zoom's fault. It's all their fault. You still have we your... Love you, Zoom. Overlord Zoom. You have your filter on. Oh. Meow. Meow. There you go. Is that better? There you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I hope everybody really enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. Oh, I, I did. It was awesome. They were, they were so much fun to talk to. They had such... I mean, and that, that bumper he gave us... I heard yep. the beginning of the show was yep. freaking cool. Yep. He's just a, they're such a cute and couple together. <laughs> they, they are. And, and I will tell everybody this as a little bit of a, we, sometimes we add stuff to the end of the episode after the music. Yep. You should stick around after the music for this one because you're going to want to hear what's said. It's nice. some pretty cool stuff. And it, and it has, it, it ties into, ties into, to, you know, our tagline a little bit there. So, yep. So I would definitely stick around after the show and listen for the next 15 minutes afterwards. There you go. All right, guys, I think that'll do it. But before we go, yep. if you like listening to Walt and Wheezy, go check out spoilerverse.com. There is a ton of interviews there. And I'm, I'm talking a ton. So and many. If you want to listen to like Jerry Conway, maybe you want to hear Ben Temple Smith, maybe you want to listen to Eric Larson. Uh, it just goes on and on. There's so many. I can't. I can't keep up with all of them. And it's not just comic books. If you yeah. are into TV and movies and you want to hear from directors, producers, and people who create music for scores on movies, it's, it, it's awesome. It's all right there. And all of it is free right now. It's crazy. Yeah, no paywall. You can go there and listen to it and read all the articles by Jay Roach and Sarah Kay. Hear all of our podcasts here. <laughs> Prison and Geekdoms and Haphazard Adventures and Funny Book Forensics coming soon. And also yep. soon here, Nerd from the Crypt and all the other shows out there. No paywall. But 
if you do want to give us some money to help us out, to keep the lights on, there's a link to a store right in the middle of that top bar there. Hey, stop punching me. And you can click on that and you can go to our store and get cool stuff like the shirt Kendrick's wearing, if you can see it. And if you can see me as well, the shirt, this shirt right here. And we got so many more shirts and hoodies and all this kind of awesome stuff. All and if you're not shows. listening to us, watch this on YouTube. Yep. Yeah, all the shows. If you're listening to us on a podcast, go to YouTube and check it out because you want to see this cool stuff. And go to our store. There's our show. There's more shows. We are adding a, trying to add one new design each week. We just put up one for Open the Mind, Read More, which is awesome. I've already ordered mine. We've sold a bunch of them. You should go yep. order one too. Yeah. Yeah. I got to go actually go order mine. I think I'm going to get mine in a hoodie because I don't have a hoodie. Yet. Nice. So there you nice, go. Nice. All I right. Two hoodies because I'm a dumbass. That is a show. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And don't forget, the notions of podcasts. We are Cthulhu. And as Cthulhu compels you to do, open the mind and read more. you on this thing on this on the screen your shirt goes from orange to aqua to kind of a teal blue it's a, yes it's a, yeah it it's a te- changing colors why is that i don't know it might just be the camera because i'm on a, it's just a laptop camera and then the lighting it's just a teal blue there you go well, teal is what it is now and then it, it's 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 cycling through again it's very funny is that a, is that a real background behind you no no it's a virtual there's a i have a that's green what, screen that's what's happening wheeze it's, yeah, it's that thing in combined combination with his shirt. He's lucky he has he has a shirt on, and actually yeah. his head doesn't end at his neck because he's yeah. in the blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I got this color because my daughter's favorite color is blue because of Rainbow Dash in with right. My Little Ponies. Oh, all right. So of course, when I ordered a shirt, I'm like, I'm getting a blue one. Yeah. <laughs> and your mom's like, the suck. real color is really nice. I mean, the other colors are fine too, but. <laughs> I thought that was a virtual background, and I, I'm sure that's why your shirt is changing colors. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, we um, we, we're trying to do these hype videos, you know, to 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 get people aware because I feel like we have a really great show. We get a lot of great people on, and we want to get more people involved. And so we started doing these virtual backgrounds. And Johnny and I every week will do this. Is what coming out on Spoiler Country, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I'll do a big voice, voice. Huh? Where are you guys located? We're in C. So John and I are right in a suburb of Seattle called Maple Valley. Okay. We're about twenty miles away from from downtown Seattle, and then Jeff is in Rhode Island. Oh, whereabouts in Rhode Island? Oh, Warwick, Rhode Island. That's near Providence. Oh, okay. Oh, Warwick. Yeah. Well, I went yeah. to Ridley, so. Oh yeah, yeah. It's not too far from um, from where I work. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I will say this: the city is much more beautiful now than it was when I was there. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I was there in the old days. The river was almost entirely covered over. Oh, wow. At that time, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records as the widest bridge in the world. Because yeah. it was one block long to get across the river. But it was like multiple blocks wide because it covered a lot of the river. So, And it was, it was a pretty shabby downtown. Um, I mean, it was fine. But it was, uh, it was quite different. And then it was great. Country, cool. wasn't it? What's that? <laughs> Mob country. It was mob. Oh yeah, that was the story. It might still be for. But well, I don't, I don't want to say that on the radio. <laughs> well, that, that's still probably the best ad Rhode Island's ever going to get. It's not as bad as it used to be. <laughs> right. was very cool back. Then. I was a big Lovecraft. Speaking of Cthulhu, a big Lovecraft fan. You could yeah. not do this now. I was there in '69 to '72, and if you read the novel, The Strange Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Yep. There's a passage in there where Ward comes back to Rhode Island, back to Providence, and he takes the train, and he gets off at the train station, and he gets, I think, probably a horse-drawn carriage, something like, maybe a cab, I don't remember, and he rides back up uh, Waterman Street to uh, South Angel and goes to the mansion, the Charles Dexter, the Dexter Ward Mansion, or whatever it was called. And back then, you could go to the train station, stand in front of it, hold the book in your hands, and read the book and follow his path over to Waterman Street. Up That's Waterman, cool. That is very cool. And you could find the Charles Dexter Ward Mansion. 
That's they awesome. Down, the railroad station has been moved after a million years, years ago now, but it had been yeah. there forever. It's been moved further away toward beyond the capital a little bit or off to one side. And the downtown's changed enormously. So if you got onto College Hill, that hasn't changed much, or at least last time I was there. You could follow that little bit. But before you were actually able to follow his entire course from the railroad station and find his mansion. Yeah. You can also find the Shun House. The <laughs> Shun House is on Benefit Street. Yeah, I, the book, you can find Benefit Street. You can find the Shun House. <laughs> Where the giant lives somewhere underneath it. Well, yeah. I would say I teach um, the thing on the doorstep to my sophomores from uh, Lovecraft because it has the greatest hook of all time. I'm sure, I'm sure you, you, know, you know the hook. And one thing I was able to do with my class, we drove to his gravestone and we, got, we were able to visit it. Mm-hmm. And there's still a lot of stuff. People still put books and memorabilia at the tombstone to this day, apparently, because it was loaded with stuff all around it. In That's the incredible. old days, when I was in Providence, he had no gravestone. Oh, wow. There was so little money. The, the, the graves are, I was there too. I was there once when there was no gravestone. I lived in Providence. And the reason I stopped and visited it, maybe we came through Providence about 10 years ago, and I stopped over there to see it. Um, but the gravestones are a, a history of the family fortunes. If you look, there was a large obelisk with a family name on it. It was his grandfather, and they had a lot of money. And then next to the obelisk, there were two gravestones with the names of his parents, because the money was going away. And then there was a blank space, just a little plot. And there was another gravestone, somebody else beside on, on the right of that, as you faced him. And the unmarked plot was Lovecraft's grave. Oh, wow. They did, that's where he was ba- buried originally. I mean, he's still buried there. That's where it was originally. And if you look at the obelisk, just to your left, as you're looking at his grave, you'll see they couldn't afford a grave marker, so they chiseled his name on the side of his grandfather's obelisk. Oh, wow. wow. I didn't know that. Was like being there, but they didn't have it on top of the grave. We visited 10 years ago. I, was, I think some Lovecraft aficionados, I think, got together and raised the money. And so it's, I'm pretty sure, we may remember, I think it was a matching gravestone for, the, for whatever his parents had. So That's crazy. We, so I took a couple of quick photographs uh, of us. And so I did, so getting to do so, one of the guards came, a little, a little putt-putt came tooting along, and he, he chided us. He said, you're not supposed to be taking photographs. I'm not sure why not. But yeah. Said, okay, I get it. You know, no problem. He said, so I'm going to go off now, and I'm going to go around that hill, and I'll be out of sight. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 honestly, God, that's what happened to us. When, when, I, when we went to the class, um, I was at a school for kids from, from a juvenile detention. I told them, behave yourselves, don't get into any trouble. So when we got to the gravestone, me and the teacher I was with, we did a rubbing of the gravesite, and the uh, guard came and yelled at us. For, and we, we were actually the teachers who caused the problem, not the students in that case. We were the ones who made the rubbing and got ourselves almost kicked <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, that's it, great. Probably, I mean, I, I expect people might, you know, uh, being what they are, might you know be tempted to damage the grave itself or damage yeah. the stone, chip a little stone off so you can take away a piece of Lovecraft's gravestone, stuff yeah. like that. But hey. they were this guy was very cool about it. Though. He just, I mean, we had no idea. We were just taking pictures. We weren't taking it, and so he just said, "Well, I'm going to go off around the corner there." So, yeah. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> a, okay, nice. Thank there, you. <laughs> hey, there's a series of books that I think you might be interested in, uh, based on the fact that you're, you know, obviously very knowledgeable on the North mythology and and stuff and this guy named uh, eric henry vick wrote a series of stories around norse mythology but it's a it's a different take it's about a it's about a cop where his son and his wife gets kidnapped and they get kidnapped by these norse gods that are that were living in america we're living in in, in today's right they, there's a series of murders and he's you know they kind of set them up and they mess with them. And, and uh, anyways, they take off back to their, their homeland through a portal and then he follows them. And it's a amalgamation of all these Norse mythologies going cool. on. And, it, and it's called the wild hunt. He's got three books in it right now. The wild hunt, errant gods, rooms of ruin and the wild hunt. His name is Eric Henry Vick. And uh, I, I listen to the audio books and the guy that does the narration does a wonderful job. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you, you might, yeah, he, it, they use a lot of, of, he, the guy uses a lot of stuff. Like one of the things he did is Thor's name is Molnir, and, and, but everybody called him Thor because on his hammer, they engraved Thor. 
So when he went into battle, they saw Thor on the hammer and they uh-huh. thought that was his name. So everybody called him Thor, but that's not his, that was never his actual name. Oh, how funny. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. I think you should check it out. I mean, I don't know. You, maybe you'll love it. Maybe you'll be like, this guy's an idiot. Oh, Why didn't you give this to me? <laughs> All right, guys, we'll let you get going. It's, it's, it's already well, yeah, it's two hours in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Thank, thank you so you much. We'll talk, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. You guys be good. Thanks, Weezy. Thanks, Walt. Stay safe. Our, our pleasure. Bye. Bye.